good afternoon all the uh, distinguished guests uh, joining the webinar organized by the Pathfinder Foundation and COVID-19 and the economy, the which way now for Sri Lanka. The way forward to be discussed in this panel, we have a couple of distinguished guests and uh, no need to give a detailed introduction. And we have uh, Dr. Ganeshan Vignaraja as the Senior Research Associate Overseas Development Institute, London, and Senior Visiting Fellow, Pathfinder Foundation, who will be giving the main presentation uh, in about uh, 20 minutes time, uh, for about 20 minutes time. And then I and my uh, friend, I'm uh, Sirimala Beratna, and my friend uh, together with me, Indajit Kumaraswamy, Again, no need to give an introduction, distinguished fellow of the Pathfinder Foundation, and also a former governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Two of us will be chairing this session and moderating the discussion. After the main presentation, uh, we will have a discussion time. Uh, two distinguished guests, uh, speakers to discuss from their on perspectives of the issue, uh, Dilene Gunavardhana, Professor of Economics from the University of Pera Denia, and Nehal Fonseca, Senior Independent Director and Chairman, Board Audit Committee at John Keels Holdings, uh, also a former uh, monetary board member of the Central Bank. And each one of the discussions will have about 10 minutes to provide their uh, comments and which will be followed by a question and answer session uh, for about 20, 25 minutes. And uh, we will be closing the session at four o'clock. So one and a half hours to <laughs> COVID-19 and the economy, the which, which way now for Sri Lanka. Uh, we know that uh, about more than one and a half years, we have been dealing with, coping with, struggling with, the pandemic issue and not all the issues are pandemic related. And as we have discussed in a couple of times, and some of them are pre-pandemic and non-pandemic. And however, we have seen how the government has been dealing with all these issues. Much of the effort has been uh, seen in uh, credit financing and money printing as many have started talking about these two issues. But uh, by the way, uh, it is also a time that we should, we should slow down in terms of going forward in this direction because the world is now, uh, world is now getting heated as a side effect of the vaccination program. Uh, <laughs> uh, vaccination program has uh, already, I think, more than five and a half billion people in the world have been vaccinated and in Sri Lanka also, as I was told, and the vaccination program has been among the developing countries, a successful play case and more than 50% of our population has already been uh, given both vaccines. And it's, a, it's a quite a, a large, good number for a developing country. Uh, among the advanced countries, it is remaining somewhere between 60 to 70%. Uh, of the population, those who have received both vaccination. However, as a side effects of the vaccination program, the world is also showing signs of recovery as well as there is also uh, building up pressure on the price prices in the world economy. So with those things, I think we will have to think in new ways and also looking at our own problems. Own problems means not everything is pandemic related, but there are non-pandemic issues as well as, as, well as there are pre-pandemic issues. And how do we deal with all these issues? And uh, Dr. Indujit Kumar Asami, would you like to add something to before the presentation, Dr. Vignaraja? Thank you, Sirimal. Um, I am going to uh, take a bit of a historical perspective. My understanding is that Ganeshan will be looking at the impact of the pandemic uh, 
uh, the government's response to it, as well as the way forward. Now, I think it's important for us, when it comes to the way forward, to learn from our mistakes and to ensure that we build back better, that we don't keep making the same mistakes and again and again. So in order to just give a little background to Ganeshan's uh, presentation, um, I think it's important to recall that before the pandemic, this economy, the Sri Lankan economy has been subject to macroeconomic stress for most of its post-independence period. For decades, we've had macroeconomic stress. And the main source of instability has been the government's budgetary operations. This has been going on for many years. And at the time of the pandemic, we were a twin deficit country, the most vulnerable category of countries um, with a, a unsustainable budgetary uh, position and an unsustainable current account in the balance of payments. So how do we get over it? To get over it, we need to understand what has caused it. And if you look historically, if you look at the last 25 years, the problem on the budgetary side has been the steady decline in revenue. Expenditure is at 20% of GDP. And that, if you look at our comparators, is not a bad number. Significant, improved, uh, significant scope to improve the quality of expenditure, but the overall number is okay. But revenue, we used to collect about 19, 20% up to the mid 90s. Now, even before the pandemic, it had come down to about 12%. In the two years, the last, last year, it came down below 10% and it's going to be the same this year. So clearly that cannot continue. So we need once and for all to put in place a taxation system or revenue generation system for the government, which will give us sustainable outcome. It can't be done immediately, but we need to have a clear medium term plan to get revenue back up to about 15%. So that has to be part of the building back better agenda. And I think um, if you look at the balance of payments, similarly, the main source of, of, uh, of uh, instability has been the trade account. A export of goods and services, which were 39% of GDP in, in the year 2000, have come down to about 21, 22%. And the reason for that is that we've had an anti-export bias in our policy framework consistently. Exchange rate was often overvalued, subsidizing foreign producers at the expense of domestic producers. And protection, effective protection, had almost doubled. And it, what it did was it excluded us from the opportunity to penetrate global supply chains, which had been the most dynamic component of the international trading system. So both these things, you know, I think we need to resolve them. We need to address them. Now, we, we need to ask ourselves, do we need to do something to tie our hands? Because we don't seem to be able to do that. You know, we don't seem to be able to maintain disciplined fiscal operations in particular. Because that is what's really feeding into the instability in the system. And we need to ask ourselves whether the Fiscal Management Responsibility Act needs to be strengthened. We need to ask ourselves whether the central banks uh, uh, needs to be given greater autonomy so that it is not subject to fiscal forbearance, which has been the case for many years. So these are things, how do we do it? How do we tie our hands to make, and ideally legislatively, to make sure that we don't keep making the same mistakes again and again. So addressing macroeconomic stress has to be in a, in a, in a, in a manner that kind of puts us onto a new path, has to be a critical part, part of the Building Back Better agenda. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Indrajit. Uh, within exactly in five minutes, you put it in the perspective and looking at both growth side as well as the stability side of the economy, looking at the macroeconomic stress as well as the export uh, sluggish export performance and growth performance of the country, which have been the fundamentals of this problem. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, Listen to Ganesh, uh, uh, who is going to make the main presentation in 20 minutes uh, about, the, uh, about the pandemic issue and the way forward for Sri Lanka. Ganesh, over to you. 
Mike. Thank you, thank okay. you very much, Sirimal. Um, while the PowerPoint is coming up, I just want to uh, thank uh, the Overseas Development Institute and the IDRC in Canada uh, and Pathfinder for uh, having this event. Uh, and also all the eminent uh, resource persons for joining today. Uh, this paper was written for uh, a research project on uh, sharing and shaping the macro economy in response to COVID, uh, which was being managed by uh, the ODI in London, uh, where I'm also a senior research associate. Uh, next slide, please. So by way of kind of backdrop to this uh, presentation, uh, Sri Lanka really is a, is a fascinating case of uh, a country uh, undergoing COVID, a uh, middle-income country, um, and uh, with these pre-existing macroeconomic stresses uh, that uh, Indrajit Kumarasamy talked about. And the fascination really comes from uh, two uh, interesting uh, reasons. The first is you've had Nobel Prize laureates, uh, Amatya Sen and uh, Joe Stiglitz, amongst others, who uh, thought that Sri Lanka had uh, favorable initial conditions for rapid economic development. Uh, they talked a lot about the highly educated population and the strategic geographical location. Um, but they also noted that uh, the disappointing issue was on growth and on structural change. Uh, in the economy um, and uh, other related issues. Um, a second reason why the Sri Lankan case uh, is fascinating is you've had a new administration in power in 2019, just before the pandemic, with this very ambitious agenda uh, under the vistas of prosperity and splendor to transform the country, it emphasized national security and the economy. And there were, I think, numbers uh, in the document that talked about 6% growth by 2025 and a per capita income in Sri Lanka of uh, $6,500. And remember, Sri Lanka's growth at that point was around 2 3% a year, and per capita income was around 4000 So this was quite a big ask. So we're going to try to answer three types of questions that I think are interesting during the 18 months of the pandemic. How severe was the hit? Um, what was the effectiveness of the policy response and what might be some of the complementary policies. Uh, now, this is really an attempt at an evidence-based analysis uh, shifting through all the relevant information. Next slide, please. Um, if there is one takeaway on the hit of the pandemic, I think these two slides uh, may show us that. Um, on the left-hand side, you have the growth rate of the Sri Lankan economy uh, since 2014, 15, um, and you have essentially annual and quarterly uh, rates of growth. The, the squiggly line is the uh, quarterly rate and the bars are basically the annual rate and the uh, number at the end, which is slightly shaded is the forecast. Uh, the chart on the right is uh, poverty uh, measured uh, at uh, $3.20, $1.90 and 550. And if you look at the growth rate chart, um, you see the hit of the pandemic. It was minus uh, three odd percent, 3.6 uh, percent in 2020. Um, and if you remember, the quarterly data were quite interesting for 2020. Um, you had a pickup um, after this very uh, deep plummet in the qu second quarter um, of 16.3 percent plummeting. And that was the lockdown period. The, 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 which was quite lengthy and the closure of the airport and all of those issues coupled in. And Sri Lanka was not quite used to that type of um, uh, set of situations. Um, and then after that point of, of the second half of 2020, you saw the beginning of recovery. Um, and then you had this steep rise in the first half of 2021, 8% uh, uh, growth rate. And, and remember in the second quarter of 2021, there was this 12.3% uh, jump. And the central bank, uh, I think, most recently talks about 5% forecast for this year. Uh, now, this is obviously very encouraging to all of us uh, looking at Sri Lanka. Uh, but remember, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is a small economy with a very narrow production base, uh, primary products, and also single commodity uh, uh, export uh, garments uh, manufactured uh, here. Um, and these types of small economies tend to be very volatile in their growth rates. If you look at this, they're, they're very subject to external shocks. Uh, so that's one kind of issue there. Uh, 
Now the pickup in 2021, a lot of people have been puzzled about it. Um, this probably reflects a base effect of a deep contraction. Um, if you go down very far, you, you come back up sometimes very fast, and that's a base effect. Uh, a second one is pent up demand. I mean, people, consumers and industry definitely wanted to spend uh, and they were constrained from doing so and they spent. And there was this issue of easy credit, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Sirimal mentioned uh, on very low interest rates, historically low rates. Uh, and then there was some export uh, pickup. So there are a whole bunch of factors that explain this. Now the central bank projects this 5% uh, growth rate for 2021. Um, but when you factor in very high uncertainty in Sri Lanka, the debt overhang and uh, rainfall affecting agriculture, uh, and also uh, global interest rates, uh, which could come and affect us, um, uh, particularly because our debt is in dollars, uh, you have the IFI is projecting uh, lower growth for this year. Uh, so that's the story on the growth side. Um, the poverty side, I mean, this, this human cost of the pandemic, I think, has not been discussed enough in the uh, newspapers or elsewhere. And um, if you take a number that I find very interesting is the middle income poverty number, which is at $3.20 a day. Um, there was a big increase in our poverty to some nearly 12% of, of, of the population. And that's half a million people in poverty. Uh, and uh, remember, um, uh, I think that's probably an underestimate of actually the real figure. Um, and there were significant losses of jobs and incomes tourism and garments were in uh, difficulty um, and the daily wage earners particularly were affected some 70 percent of the uh, labor force um, and also small firms were hardly uh, were really badly affected uh, and remember we also have the specter of rising food price inflation um, uh, and also energy price inflation which could come which has also hit the cost of living so i personally worry a lot about the social uh, cohesion and stability aspects uh, of where we are in this pandemic. And uh, to me, this human cost uh, is, a, is a really terrible thing that we are witnessing. Uh, next slide, please. So here is an attempt to start thinking about uh, what are some of the uh, stylized facts about the pandemic. Uh, I've talked about a couple of them. Uh, let me just uh, talk about some of the others. Uh, briefly, uh, exports uh, uh, fell uh, quite a bit, um, and the, but the good news is there's a small uh, export uptick if you take the 2021 half year um, and you compare it with the previous uh, half year, 2020 half year, uh, somewhat encouraging, but still small. Um, then there was a big loss in incomes and, 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 and jobs, and then the pandemic affected women's employment uh, significantly. Uh, there were heightened uh, work-life pressures for some women um, and uh, they dropped out of the workforce um, and anyway these women are at risk of higher unemployment um, and that is uh, one uh, set of issues. Mental health is another set of issues around that. Uh, female labor force participation rates that I have uh, declined from 34.5 percent to 32.1 percent between 2019 and 2020 and that gives you some hit and female unemployment rates also rose. Um, now the pandemic uh, luckily did not have much negative impact on CO2 emissions uh, because climate is perhaps the next big risk uh, for Sri Lanka uh, to come. Uh, in fact there was probably some decline in emissions if you take anecdotal information uh, measured by um, some of the measuring stations here uh, also at the embassies. Uh, but what is very clear is on the green side, uh, we've had seen a very, very slow shift to greening of energy in Sri Lanka. If anything, there's been a slight increase in um, carbon-based uh, fuel use, uh, which is a problem for us. Um, so that's a kind of a quick view of where we are in the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Dr. Kumarasamy talked about the macro issue uh, and the twin deficit problem uh, is very much an issue that we worry about. Um, and part of that is this external sector uh, that has had uh, big declines in exports, FDI and tourism. Um, and then there was this artificial fall in imports um, and also worker remittances uh, have held up generally. Uh, so that, that was generally the case. However, in uh, the last six months, if I recall this right, 
uh, the external sector data from the central bank, which I think came out for July, uh, talks about uh, remittances coming down a bit, which is a which is a further worry. And of course, tourism and the other components haven't picked up. Now, all of this means really uh, the debt dynamics of Sri Lanka on the external side are, are worrying. Um, according to some estimates, and I think Fitch uh, provided a number last year, Sri Lanka owes something like $23.2 billion between 2021 and 2025, um, and that's about $4 billion a year. Um, uh, now, remember, against this, you have to set our external reserves, and the latest central bank number uh, is reserved of $2.8 billion at the end of July. And this was after paying the $1 billion ISBN uh, that was paid at the end of July. That translates into about 1.8 months of imports. Now, of course, the good news a uh, little bit uh, is that in August, uh, we got the SDR allocation from the IMF, which was $787 million. There was $150 million from the Bangladesh Bank. And I think they're expecting some money if it's not already come from a China Development Bank loan. So that could take reserves above 3 billion, uh, but there is a gap um, in that context. And all of this is happening against this anti-export bias in the trade regime. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the second uh, issue that I want to briefly touch upon is, is what was the uh, government's response? Um, and typically uh, what you see across the developed and developed world is the use of fiscal policy stimulus uh, where the government uh, uses basically the fiscal multiplier to try to keep growth holding and also to uh, ensure that the distributional effects are not uh, unduly adverse. In Sri Lanka, however, uh, we started the pandemic with uh, quite weak macroeconomic conditions. So that meant that our fiscal uh, stimulus was probably uh, less than 1% of GDP, probably near 0.8% if you uh, take the number that the IMF have put on their website. Uh, now these stimulant packages in uh, advanced countries can be as much as between 5 to 10% of GDP. I think the US package is even larger than that. Um, and in some other countries there are certainly some very big numbers. Uh, for developing countries on average, uh, my recollection of what the IMF is saying is the number varies between 2 to 5% of uh, GDP. Uh, but India's, for instance, is much larger than that, and Bangladesh is attempting to do a bigger number than that. Uh, so our uh, fiscal stimulus uh, is, is below par in that regard. Now, in the absence of this, um, the central bank uh, really uh, rolled up its shirt sleeves and performed admiral national service for Sri Lanka. Uh, they put in place a unprecedented monetary policy easing uh, approach. Uh, they they made uh, liquidity available to the banking system. They relaxed interest rates, policy rates several times. Uh, they relaxed regulatory forbearance, uh, which meant that debt moratoria and guarantees and concessional loans could be provided. So they did a whole lot more uh, than uh, would be normal uh, under conservative circumstances. They were quite activist um, and, and was very, very important uh, and deserve our sincere thanks for that. Um, the other important measures which were done, and some people say this is an unconventional package, uh, is that there was uh, import restrictions uh, introduced in uh, March uh, 2020, which uh, choked off most uh, non-essential imports, and uh, particularly uh, uh, imports of vehicles and uh, uh, other things were cut, um, and uh, this uh, conserved foreign exchange. Um, I think the balance of trade on Sri Lanka, uh, the deficit fell from 8 billion to 6 billion uh, between 2019 and 2020. And then there was a heavy reliance on these currency swap arrangements uh, with India, with uh, China, with uh, Bangladesh, uh, and they're attempting to explore many others, uh, and also loans from the China Development Bank and others for external debt management. Uh, and then there were attempts to try to get exports together. I mean, there was more export uh, marketing services provided by the EDB a new FDI strategy uh, that, that is there. There's some attempt to create uh, and cut red tape. Uh, there's a deregulation commission. Uh, there was voluntary pay restraint on the private sector to keep jobs. I think that was for a couple of months last year. It was a presidential uh, task force and so on. Um, and the conclusion I reach from having thought about the evidence uh, is that to some extent, this unconventional package helped to as avert significant scarring and support the economy. Um, and, and that was uh, important. Uh, next slide, please. But as always, there is a, a catch here. Uh, this unconventional package really uh, 
with stabilization measures could also have some drawbacks for our fragile economy and uh, perhaps even impede the recovery in, in the medium term. Um, for instance, the pickup in private sector credit uh, could lead to inflationary pressures uh, and relaxation of uh, financial regulations could pose risks uh, to financial stability. Uh, you've seen uh, inflation creeping up and I think the central bank uh, signaled a few weeks ago that it was beginning to taper off um, interest rate uh, uh, softening. Um, and uh, we have seen NPLs um, in the non-banking system in particular, but also among some of the banks creep up. Um, and this is before some of the data have come into play. Um, the import substitution, look, we tried that in the 1970s and it was a, a dismal failure, uh, sadly, uh, mainly because in a small economy of our size, uh, you know, the easy phase of import substitution uh, basically what can be made, um, you know, runs out very fast. And then you have uh, the problems of misallocated resourcing kicking in, uh, exporting gets significantly hindered by an anti-export bias. Uh, exporters are much more incentivized to try to produce uh, for the domestic market, uh, thereby um, depriving the consumer of choice. Uh, and then the kicker is also retaliation from trading partners. We have a EU delegation in the country here I think right now still uh, looking at the GSP plus and part of that is us being uh, a good player uh, on uh, keeping our markets open and then there's of course the human rights dimension with the EU which explore, uh, which is an added kicker. Um, and I'm not sure if we've notified to the WTO uh, the fact that we have these import controls in place, uh, so there are some risks for us um, from this import substitution. And currency swaps, you know, themselves are also a short term measure. Um, it's highly costly uh, to uh, use uh, these measures. Uh, and they're also subject to geopolitics. Um, uh, if we go to one large country uh, for uh, such swap arrangements, or indeed another large country, uh, we may be subject to the vagaries of their own uh, interests rather than our own. And these are problems uh, that Sri Lanka could affect. Now on the forecast number, um, I think it's rather encouraging that we are beginning to see this 8%. Uh, but, uh, you know, there are different weightings of the risks to this economy. Um, the uh, essential uh, story uh, from the IFIs, if you take a weighted average of all their forecasts, sorry, a simple average of all their forecasts, is that comes in at 2% less than the central bank forecast for 2021. Uh, Ganesh, uh, sorry to interrupt you. May I uh, uh, give you an indication of the timing? It is less than four minutes. Sure, thank you very much. I will uh, start wrapping up. Next slide, please. So last year, um, this uh, table uh, shows us the uh, measures that we presented in report to His Excellency the President, um, done by the Pathfinder Foundation and chaired by Dr. Kumar Sami. And we came up with a very uh, wide ranging uh, strategy that we may uh, want to use um, for Sri Lanka. And that was to mitigate the hardships of the people uh, to ensure that we dealt with the fiscal issues and also the external reserve issue and improve the climate uh, for the uh, private sector. And basically, we were advocating a refined strategy uh, to take Sri Lanka out of this uh, stabilization phase uh, to a recovery. And I want to pick up on three measures very briefly in the three minutes I have left uh, to try to show you some uh, further work that I have done for this paper. Next slide, please. Uh, one slide was on this uh, fiscal stimulus, and uh, it's true that we're talking about uh, Sri Lanka being fiscally constrained, uh, but uh, imagine uh, that we are able uh, to raise taxation uh, properly uh, and also get external financing uh, from either combination of bilaterals uh, who have been very generous to us uh, and also international uh, institutions. Um, and um, one imagines here that Sri Lanka is implementing fiscal stimuluses um, on a scale uh, going up from say 3% in 2023, right up to about 5% in 2025. Now the effects from this, um, uh, you get three uh, types of things that we get, uh, untargeted stimulus, a targeted expansion, uh, allowing for renewable energy and gender specific responses and social protection. And you compare this against an IMF uh, forecast now, what you get is a fiscal stimulus, whether targeted or not, gives you a higher growth than a baseline forecast, particularly in 2023 to 2025. 
And we may need this if we want to achieve this uh, vision envisaged by the president in his vistas of uh, prosperity and splendor, 6%. Now, of course, um, I'm going to show you some numbers. Now, a targeted one is better uh, than an untargeted. Let me just briefly show you the graph, and then I'll talk about the other two things in the last couple of minutes I have. Uh, next slide, please. Here is a very simple graph showing you the simulations that we did. And you get the 6% by 2025 if you use a targeted fiscal stimulus that uh, emphasizes um, uh, investment in environmental and renewable energy as amongst other types of infrastructure, as well as social protection and gender. And that's much higher, 1.8% higher than a business as usual scenario, which may give you 4%. Next slide, please. Uh, the second issue is about trade, and um, I want to talk about uh, free trade agreements, uh, which uh, were seen as a bad word in Sri Lanka. And uh, I'm going to try to show you some simulations from a model-based exercise. And this is a very sophisticated exercise uh, involving 400 equation type model. And what we tried to do with help of the ODI was to model a China FTA uh, resembling the proposal in 2017, uh, the Chinese uh, proposal that we open up all our goods uh, to imports from China. Uh, a second uh, scenario was a sort of an ECTA type uh, story, uh, which we uh, tried to uh, talk about uh, opening up of goods, uh, elimination of some tariff, non-tariff measures, and some services opening up, which is kind of the ECTA. And then a BIMSTEC FTA, regional FTA. Now, the result is very interesting. Uh, the regional FTA gives us higher export gains than the two bilaterals. And then if you look at the enhanced India FTA versus a goods only uh, China FTA, uh, the India FTA is better for us. And this is in terms of the export effects. Um, next slide, please. There are very detailed sectoral results and I won't go into them, but um, the interesting thing for me is what happens to our major sectors. Um, and uh, we can come back to this in the chat. Uh, and uh, we also have some results for other things that may be useful. Let me just talk about the last thing. If I may have one minute extra, Mr. Chair, with your indulgence, just to briefly talk about this. Is that okay? That's fine. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Next slide, please. The last uh, is about the port city. And I just want to briefly uh, talk about some simulation work that we did. Uh, we had a commission, as you may remember, uh, and there was some very useful work done by PwC and, and when I was at LKI, we tried to do some uh, scenario planning. Um, and we tried to look at what the CPC would do uh, to uh, services FDI, foreign exchange from services value added and so on. And we had a kind of a high case scenario and uh, a low case kind of scenario. And the conclusion we came is that the CPC can be an engine of FDI led transformation if it's supported by a competitive SEZ uh, framework and conducive national policies. Let me just show you some numbers and I will then stop. Uh, next slide, please. Um, essentially, um, let me just uh, go to the very last two columns. Uh, value added in the economy could rise uh, by 3% uh, to 11% under a high case scenario. Uh, employment in the services sector and generally could rise by 2%, um, et cetera, et cetera. So the CPC could. Um, and now this, the kicker is, is the two things I mentioned, a, a, a proper transparent SEZ incentive package uh, and framework along with national policies uh, that are also conducive. And that involves a, a proper immigration system to encourage people to want to come, um, a proper regulation of money laundering, um, proper marketing the country to exports and so on. So th there are many things we have to do if we want this to succeed. Next slide, please. And just in conclusion, uh, the pandemic uh, was the worst in our history. There are encouraging signs that uh, we're coming out of this, but uh, you know, we may not be out of the woods yet um, because there are many risks that are coming there. Um, we adopted an unconventional policy package to try to get us out of the problem of the pandemic. And to some extent, it helped avert significant scarring and provided support. But keeping these measures in place beyond the short term could be adverse for the fragile economy and may even impede recovery. Um, and there are various risks that are coming. Um, and we need to consider, uh, you know, going from the Pathfinder framework that we came up with uh, to a much more sustainable long term story. And for that, we need to consider a fiscal stimulus, uh, opening up trade um, with other countries uh, through FTAs and leveraging services. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair.
Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. And I know that you didn't cover even 10% what you want to cover. And it's a ruthless uh, cut down of all your ideas to a very minimal level. But anyway, thank you so much for covering uh, such a uh, big area, even with, within the given 20 minutes time. Uh, I'm not going to elaborate anything. Straight away, we are going for the discussions. And uh, Dilini, are you here? Right, can you? Uh, yes, okay. Over to you, Dilini, Professor Dilini Gunavadana from Peradeni University. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Sirimal, and thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Vignaraja for that excellent uh, presentation. Uh, very interesting and thank you to the Pathfinder for giving me this opportunity to be here. So what I want uh, to do in the next few minutes is to, uh, as, as you can see, this is what uh, Dr. Vignaraja presented. He assessed the impact of the shock and the government response and presented policy scenarios. And what I would like to do is to highlight some key points, elaborate on these selected points, and then highlight the distributional aspects and particularly the gender aspects, uh, both of COVID-19 and to elaborate on some gender sensitive policies in line with uh, the policies that were discussed. So if we <clears throat> uh, talk about the context of the macroeconomy, uh, Dr. Vignaraja mentioned the uh, fiscal situation. Um, we think about you know, the previous tax cuts. This uh, contributed to the muted fiscal response uh, that we uh, saw in response to, the, uh, to COVID. Uh, the fragile trade balances, which have then resulted in prolonged protection which again leads to misallocation of resources, the adverse debt dynamics, and a restricted trade regime with an anti-export bias. And he reminded us that this was similar to what was tried and failed in the 1970s. And I want to raise the question, which perhaps may not get answered here, but a question I think that is worth asking is what is driving decision-making? What's the objective function? Uh, is it self-sufficiency or is it some other kind of uh, political uh, driven uh, agenda? Whatever it may be, uh, what I want to remind us is that there are times when economics and politics can both, uh, you know, why these agendas can have a win-win situation. And if you think about the 1950s when Sri Lanka saw the expansion of schools and the expansion of the health network, which we are benefiting from right now. That was a very populist thing to do, but it was also good for the economy. It was good for human capital uh, in an uh, enormous way. And so it was a win-win situation. But I think the question we have to ask now is when we have uh, this kind of uh, you know, objective function, uh, does it, is it, is it still a win-win situation that we're looking at or is it a win-lose situation? Okay, so moving on to the impact of COVID, as uh, Dr. Vigniraja pointed out, we saw the negative growth uh, of last year, which was then uh, 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 followed by increased growth this year. And there is the difficulty of disentangling what was due to COVID and what was due to, uh, you know, the magnitude of the uh, negative growth we saw might have been different had our economy been in a different situation. And similarly, the bounce back. Uh, I think Dr. Vignaraj already mentioned that poverty could actually be, the figures that were presented could be an underestimate. And I think that's likely because I think they're calculated on the basis of distributions not changing since 2016, which was when we had the last uh, estimates of poverty. 
and, um, and last distributional data. Uh, so when we think about who lost income and we think about casual workers, informal workers, self-employed and particularly small and medium entrepreneurs who are unable, who didn't have the uh, cushion uh, to be able to uh, uh, protect themselves from the shock. Uh, we can imagine that poverty uh, rates are probably higher than this. Uh, Talking about gender, uh, again, Dr. Vigniraja pointed out that uh, women's unemployment increased, labor force participation also increased during this time, as somebody pointed out in the chat. Um, this also means because of income losses that there's potential income poverty that both female headed or female supported households are facing, as well as intra house hold poverty uh, among females. Uh, there's also time poverty because we know that from uh, the uh, situation of children being at home uh, because of limited mobility, that uh, a greater proportion of women's time goes into unpaid care, which we know from time use survey uh, that the DCS did, so uh, basically there's time poverty in addition to income poverty. And there's also other types of welfare loss, such as the domestic violence uh, reports that we get from uh, the uh, result of the pandemic and the lockdowns. Finally, uh, talking in terms of distributional effects, uh, I think children and youth uh, have certainly are going to face human capital losses. Um, and I think it's debatable who is worse off, most likely the poor are worse off, but we also have to realize that they are starting from a, they are worse off, their losses may not have been greater because they would be starting from an already disadvantaged position um, and not being able to go to school may have uh, may have caused them losses. Uh, not having uh, access to uh, internet, uh, uh, not being able to afford the devices that get them the access to uh, online classes and so on would uh, certainly uh, make this. But in addition to that, I would also like to point out that the people who probably had the greatest losses would be uh, small children. So uh, primary children who would be missing out on some of their basic skills. And we don't know what the effect of that is going to be uh, in time to come. So moving on to the policy scenarios, uh, as Dr. Vigniraja pointed out, a fiscal stimulus does better than baseline growth. And a st fiscal stimulus that's targeted towards green investment and gender sensitive spending is more growth enhancing. So why targeted towards green investment and gender sensitive spending? That's on the basis of uh, prin the principle of universalism. In other words, everybody matters equally. People who are alive as well as people who are not yet born. So that's why we care about green investment. And women matter just as important as people who are not women. So uh, that's the intrinsic argument for caring about green investment and gender sensitive spending. But it's also smart economics as this exercise has shown uh, because uh, <clears throat> investing in green investment and gender sensitive spending uh, turns out to be more growth enhancing. And the reverse of that is that the economic cost of gender inequality, for instance, is extremely high and to, uh, cite the report by the McKinsey Institute in 2015, 
uh, it is as large as the size of the US and Chinese economies combined. Uh, and there are newer reports that uh, also confirm large economic losses from gender inequality. In Sri Lanka, uh, women's labor force participation is likely to be a constraint on growth. If you look at male labor force participation, it's been constant at 70 something percent uh, for a very long time. And this is uh, people over the age of 15. So there isn't a lot of leeway uh, in terms of who else you can bring into the labor force uh, if you have 70% of men already uh, in the labor force. So you have to look at women and that's been stagnant at 35%. And I think it's important that we look at why women's labor force participation has been stagnant at 35% if we are to uh, think about a gender sensitive fiscal stimulus or if we are to think about growth and think about where the labor for growth is going to come from. So um, looking at uh, what Dr. Mignoraja presented, uh, the gender sensitive fiscal stimulus was expected to come from the health and education sectors and I want to propose actually that a gender sensitive fiscal stimulus from childcare, so early childhood education and care, both uh, early ECE and childcare, uh, would make a lot of sense in terms of easing supply side constraints of unpaid care by mothers. And this would apply in a variety of sectors, which we'll probably talk about in a little while. And it creates a demand for female workers in this sector as well. And here's a study from Turkey that found, uh, did a similar exercise actually, did a CG model uh, based exercise, looking at the expansion of early childhood education and care services in Turkey and found that they created significantly more jobs than a construction boom and did so in a gender equitable manner. ECEC also has the greatest potential for improving human capital. So if we, if we think about our growth model and we want not just labor, but we want human capital, what uh, Heckman has been showing us for a very long time has been that early childhood education really matters in terms of improving the human capital of uh, human beings. Going to the third and fourth, uh, sorry, second and third uh, points that Dr. Vignaraja made in terms of the policy scenarios uh, and talking about trade policy, uh, broader agreements or multilateral agreements are going to be better than bilateral. And looking at the sectors that he talked about, I just picked out textiles and tea for their gender impacts. But like I said before, that's going to rely on a continued or an expanding female labor force participation. Uh, something I haven't mentioned so far is that while we are an uh, aging population, there is also going to be in addition to childcare, there's also going to be elder care. Uh, and that is something that we need to think about when we think about the uh, labor resources we have for growth. Uh, moving on to FDI, uh, we have uh, the uh, Colombo Port City uh, led uh, FDI scenario that was discussed. And from a gender point of view, again, this has a, uh, a lot of potential because we're talking in terms of services. So we're talking about in this case, educated, perhaps educated uh, labor, but also maybe sort of semi-skilled uh, labor as well. But in both those uh, situations, we have a lot of uh, potential for female labor force participation. But in order to uh, be able to be successful at that, we will need the social infrastructure investment that, um, both reduces 
and redistributes the unpaid care burden that women face. Uh, and along with that, we will need cultural change. So let me wrap up there. Thank you, thank you, Dilini. Uh, before I invite uh, Nehal, I want to remind uh, our distinguished audience, and you can ask the questions and uh, in the chat box, you can send the questions and you know the good characteristics of a good question in a panel discussion like this, it had to be a simple and straightforward. Thank you, and that's uh, just a reminder to all our uh, distinguished uh, audience gathering. Uh, Nihal, over to you from the private sector perspective. Thank you, Professor Srimal, and thank you to Path Found, Pathfinder Foundation for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Speaking after four eminent economists, I don't, I won't add any value in the next 10 minutes or so, I continue on the same thing. So I will therefore focus on another important aspect, that being the execution and delivery that is essential to achieve the outcomes that have been referred to by the main presenter, Dr. Vignaraja. Since you all know that as a country, this is an area that we have been weak and quite often failed. Uh, Dr. Vignaraja in his presentation showed us a very useful slide, setting out the decisive action steps. Uh, I would appreciate if you can share the slide eight, please. Yeah. Uh, slide. Ah, that one, that earlier one, right. Okay. Right. Right. And I will use that as my base so that it, you can focus on it while when I speak of implementation. The first thing that becomes apparent is that the output optimization from these various important initiatives will require the government and the private sector, by which I mean both the formal and the informal sector, to work together with a focus on outputs rather than merely carrying out tasks. I don't think... Uh, COVID caused too much of damage to the public sector employees, or for that matter, the politicians. But uh, in, in uh, but certainly the private sector and the employees of the private sector had to bear the biggest brunt of it. Uh, here again, the scale of that pain was not distributed evenly. Without going into great microanalysis, uh, generally speaking, the formal sector received some support through generous tax concessions, both before and after COVID hit us, moratoriums on loans, etc. However, the self-employed received much less support and uh, has largely been left to fend for themselves, um, almost through one year and a half. In this context, therefore, it is necessary to assess where business confidence lies today because that will be necessary for us to see how quickly we can mobilize our, our recovery platform. Uh, one of the indicators, I think probably the only indicator we have is the LMD Nielsen index, which uh, if we disregard absolutes, I mean, looking at it for trends, uh, the last survey done based on a survey in early August, that was before the current uh, lockdown, and uh, improvement in sentiment was reported. However, it's reasonable to expect that the trend would not have improved in September with the latest lockdown. It is also uh, reasonable to expect that when October survey results come out later, later in that month, the successful implementation of the vaccination campaign, the downward trend in infections and deaths, and the new roadmap to be announced by the central bank to manage the current foreign exchange crisis and other issues, economic issues that we have, could improve sentiment in the formal private sector. We can also be reasonably hopeful that lifting of lockdowns and increased mobility would also improve the sentiment among those in the informal sector. In a sense, we can expect an overall improvement of business sentiment in October towards the end, 
that will be a good launching pad for recovery action. With this higher level of confidence in place, I have some suggestions for executions and delivery. Now, Dr. Vignaraja's action step, which he has depicted on this slide, cuts across a wide range of areas. So the first challenge is the coordination of these various things to achieve a end result. So my first suggestion is therefore to have a statutorily empowered implementing authority for this post-COVID recovery. I know that we have a plethora of those. So what I suggest is a time bound with a sunset uh, uh, institution uh, where instead of the recent task forces, which we have been the case where we have found that they don't really work the way that they should work when you have multidisciplinary factors coming into play. I have in mind something like the Mahavali Authority, GCEC and BOI in their early days, not the more recent when their powers are diluted and more recently the Port City Commission. Needless to say, this agency should be given wide policy formulation and implementation powers for the post-COVID recovery and be headed by handpicked people from the private and public sector working on a full-time basis. With that in place, I would say item nine in the box that Mr. Dr. Vidaraj has presented can be both a policy formulation and implementation institution as opposed to an advisory one. Now, another factor that I would like to refer to also has general significance, which is the role of technology and digitization. Now, I see that Dr. Vidaraja has already identified it as a, a point six on his, uh, uh, on his slide. But I would like to add that technology should also encompass and work as one of the key binders of several other actions. Let me elaborate a bit. I don't think anyone will disagree when I say that COVID brought to the fore that the traditional ways of means of aids and means of working were not the only ways to do it, especially when it came to the private sector after an initial period of disruption when COVID broke out many enterprises from small to large and even some of the self-employed were able to change their work and business habits and leverage technology, especially using the high mobile telephony penetration in this country to varying degrees. Unfortunately, the public sector was less agile, although some pockets did manage to deliver services to the public through e-platforms. Uh, uh, this problem was mainly in the public sector due to the almost complete dependence on physical files for information, which could not be accessed during lockdown. So therefore, the highest priority has to be given to digitizing the information and making it accessible from everywhere, of course, with the necessary safeguards to prevent them falling into the wrong hands, which might help us even if we get over the uh, COVID uh, pandemic, there may be other circumstances which necessitate similar types of work practices. One other important thing that became quite apparent was that we got used, we have got used to processes and methodologies that had a lot of unnecessary fat. And cutting this out didn't cause any harm and in fact increased efficiency without increasing the risks. Uh, my broad suggestion, therefore, for the technology initiative is that without paying, playing catch up, we leapfrog to the next generation of technology platforms, such as data warehouses, blockchain, and digital ledgers, not to be confused with cryptocurrency, but uh, in the digitization efforts across various initiatives. For instance, the very important safety net actions that Dr. Gnaraj has referred to in his actions as in, in, block, in, in box one, should be delivered through a strong technology platform to better target and prevent abuse that which has been, the, which has been endemic to our past and existing social assistance programs. Similarly, technology can be used in action step two relating to food security and managing the end-to-end -end supply chain 
to drive down post-harvest losses, improve farm gate prices, and provide funding for the farmers, as well as the other participants in the supply chain, with greater security being provided to lenders. On Dr. Vignaraja's action point seven on labor, uh, we can benefit from a key learning during COVID lockdowns and restrictions that it was not necessary for every manager, executive, or task performer to be actually be in their workplaces day in and day out from eight to five or beyond. Obviously, manufacturing in a non-robotic environment requires workers and their supervisors to be at the factory, but it became quite clear that marketeers, merchandisers, managers, finance executives could work from almost anywhere most of the time. Now, how did this all become possible? It was the use of technology and digitization. In a country where commuting takes away a big chunk of productive time, working from home part of the time can be a huge boon, especially to our female workforce at management levels. I think uh, Dr. Gunavardhana referred in great detail to the challenges that they face. And, uh, and, and in my own experience, while at the entry level to management, there is a, like a 50-50 mix of male, female as time goes on, uh, probably due to the social motherhood and family reasons and the factor that uh, Dr. Gunavardhana mentioned than anything else, the female proportion drops sharply. In the workplaces that I have been, that I have been told by many females that they are, they are unable to put in regular eight to five hours at a workplace because of these conflicts. The most executive at management jobs today in the knowledge economy, finance, and general manager are gender agnostic. And through legislative reforms that accommodate flexibility including provisions for part-time work, while at the same time allowing businesses to manage their costs during post-COVID recovery. It will also help us to get a lot of skilled workforce, especially women, back into the workforce. Not only the uh, private sector, but I think the public sector should also, in my view, adopt the same flexible philosophy. But I do not know whether in the Sri Lankan political context whether that will be possible. So that remains to be seen. The nine action steps that Dr. Ibdaraja set out provides, as I said, a very comprehensive platform. But I would like to add one more, I think which was referred to by Dr. Gunavardhan, or Professor Gunavardhan, that is the uplifting the mental health and outlook of segments of the population that have been battered in various ways by the conflict. By, I won't go into details because I think Professor Gunavardhan has already covered that. By all accounts, COVID is here to stay and the world will have to live with it. To that extent, there is actually no post-COVID scenario that can be expected for some time because we'll have to function with COVID alongside. Now, with a successful vaccination rollout, the state and the medical system would have done what they can do to mitigate the impact. I think we will have to pick a time in the near future where we treat it as any other illness, focusing on fatalities and managing hospitalizations and not infections, as seems to be now happening in some other countries and accept that life has to go on. I may sound controversial, but uh, I am not convinced that repeated lockdowns is the answer to dealing with this pandemic, since this would only mean that we take one step forward and two steps back in the implementation of recovery plans. I will stop there and elaborate uh, if necessary during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nihal. Uh, we are moving on to a... Uh, uh, question and answer time, and I expect all the answers to be short as well because of the time. It is not nice to leave out at least some of the questions. Before that, uh, Indrajit, would you like to uh, compliment any? Your mic is uh, muted. <laughs> 
I'll I'll wait till the end because I think there's a slot for me to speak at the end. So I'll keep okay. my comments right. to that. Yeah, thank you, Indrajit. And Anushka must might be expecting uh, worse than this. So that's why he's asking this question. Averted economic scaring. He said too early to conclude that trade. So uh, Ganesh, would you like to uh, take that question first? Sure. The brief answer uh, really yeah. is that uh, having thought about it very carefully and uh, from uh, evidence we have looked at, I think the provision of liquidity for sure uh, was very helpful to keep the economy going. Um, and certainly uh, the import substitution uh, for the first uh, uh, period uh, was also probably helpful for keeping the foreign exchange reserves going. Uh, so that is why I say to some extent, uh, the package was useful uh, as part of a stabilization program. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. And another question is uh, coming from Lal. Uh, why are we going for SOPs at high interest rates rather than going for an arrangement with the IMF? <laughs> I'm not sure any of us in this panel is responsible for that. But uh, even Malati is raising the same question. I think, why are we waiting for the to go to IMF as the last resort? And probably Indrajit might be uh, willing to answer that question. Okay, I, I think that this is clearly one of the immediate challenges is the external financing um, gap. Uh, the Honorable Finance Minister said that uh, we had no dollars and we had no rupees uh, in his parliamentary speech. And, and we don't have any dollars, so how do we get it? It seems to me there are two options. One is you go down the bilateral route, that is swaps, term loans, etc. But you have to get it in sufficient scale and for sufficient duration. Because remember, we have to pay back $4 billion a year. So we have to get enough to fill this financing gap. I did a back of the envelope calculation, and I see the external financing gap up to next year is about $6 billion. We need to find about $6 billion. That is, if you look at table 4.3 in the weekly economic indicators of the central bank, you will see that about $7 billion needs to be paid back. We have about 3.5 uh, billion reserves as at the end of, of August. Um, but in September and October, we have to we have payments of 1.4 billion. So unless additional money comes in, reserves will come down below 2.5 billion. So if you, if you just look at that picture, we have to find 6 billion or so, I, I, according to the way I see it, over the next 12 months or so. Now, I don't think it's realistic to expect bilateral support to fill that gap. So the only other option is to go to the IMF. What the IMF does is its money, I mean, if you go, if you get an EFF, it's about 800 million, and we get the maximum access, we have the fair chance of getting it uh, in the current conditions. It's about 2.4 billion over three years. So you get about 800 million a year from the IMF. But on top of that, once there is an IMF program, the World Bank and ADB will give direct budgetary support and balance of payment support. They are giving us project funding now, but they will not give us direct budgetary or balance of payment support without an IMF arrangement. So that money also will come in. On top of that, in my view, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it worthwhile to reschedule the debt at this point. Because normally, the downside of rescheduling debt is losing access to capital markets. We have lost access to capital markets. We've been downgraded, and we are not likely to get access in the immediate future. So the main downside of rescheduling has been taken off the table. So should we be scarring the economy by imposing various important capital controls to secure foreign exchange, to send it out of the country to pay our external creditors who have already discounted their uh, uh, bonds by, you know, I don't know, now it's over 30%. So it seems to me if you work the numbers, there is merit in seriously thinking whether you should go ahead with a market-friendly rescheduling. And if you do a market standing reschedule, you can reschedule about 29% of, of the debt. And if you just do the calculation there as well, 
you can release maybe north of a billion dollars. So that 800 million from the IMF, then other budgetary support, plus the release of, uh, 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 of, of uh, debt servicing money, which will come with the rescheduling. Uh, that's the release of money to be used for debts, uh, uh, for, for imports, et cetera. I think, you, you know, I, to me, if you work the numbers through, the starting point is an IMF program for all that. Uh, I mean, if, if we have evidence that bilateral sources can bankroll us to the extent that we need, to the, for the period that we need, that's fine. Otherwise, because the fund program will involve some austerity, what we need to ask ourselves is, is the austerity imposed under a fund program? Is it going to be worse than the austerity we are imposing on ourselves now through import controls, capital controls, uh, and all the other measures we are taking to suppress domestic investment and compression? We are suppressing domestic absorption to have enough money to repay our debt. Is that, is that the, the best option right now? Or should we reschedule, get an IMF program, and uh, start all over again? I hope I've answered the question. Yes, uh, thank you, Indigit. I think you answered some, a couple of questions uh, in that answer, so that I can leave out some of the questions raised there. And there's a challenging question for the panel, and what are the five priority actions uh, that can be taken immediately uh, and what would be the responsibility of the political regime to that question? So what are the priority actions? Most fundamental prioritized actions that we can take, the country can take, not we, and to face the immediate situation. Anyone like to take that question? Oh, while we are reading out our answers and we will give the answers. The top five actions. Ganesh, are you there? Yes, I, I am. Think you are there, sure. Right. So the first uh, priority action, I think, uh, is really uh, to attempt to put together uh, a homegrown program of reforms. You know that uh, should take into account uh, what we have been discussing, which is the macro, the export, uh, anti-export bias, uh, and so on. Uh, and be very clear on what are the short-term actions that we need to do and the medium-term actions. And I think that needs to come out because that would also help um, people understand the costs and benefits. Uh, Indrajit uh, rightly talked about the uh, Hobson choices of austerity that we will have of an IMF program versus the bilateral route. I think these need to be all put out very clearly. And then we need to explain that to the people. So that, that's very uh, simply uh, the most important priority in my view. Uh, if I may, just uh, one other thing uh, we must do. Um, we have to absolutely ensure uh, that we use whatever money we get uh, from anybody, be it bilateral swaps, et cetera, uh, to pay the debt, but also to keep the poor off the streets. Because I, I really worry, uh, and I think Delini will agree with me, about the social stability uh, issues that we are playing with at the moment. And I think, uh, you know, uh, having looked at Latin America very carefully, where you have had, uh, you know, revolutions coming on the back of rising poverty, uh, that specter uh, keeps me awake at night. And I think uh, we need to really, really be careful about the poor. We, we, and, the, and the poor is urban, uh, it's the informal sector. Uh, and I, I really, really worry about this uh, phenomenon. So that would be the second thing I would do, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. I would like to uh, add one more thing to what you said. In fact, in your concluding uh, couple of slides, you mentioned that as well, because always uh, I hear that recovery, recovery, recovery from pandemic uh, affected economy. And recovery means going back, going back to pre-pandemic situation. Is it what we want? I have that question always. And probably I would think that we should also adopt, while we are dealing with all these urgent issues, we should also adopt or take this as an opportunity to get prepared for a takeoff. So that is what I think uh, from a medium to long-term perspective. There is also a question again about the Port City Act, Port City Bill, and is it, is it 
do we have to revise it again according to the current uh, uh, economic strategies that we are going to adopt? And that's a question. And uh, well, there are issues. Uh, anyone like to take it? Dr. Yes, uh, Indrajit and Dr. Vitnaraja, you both have to uh, have spoken about the anti-export bias. What should be the pro-export bias for Sri Lanka look like? Somebody is asking from Washington. The difference between anti-export bias and pro-export bias. Um, shall I just briefly yeah. say something, Indrajit, and then let you come in? Um, yes. So, so the first thing we've got to try to do um, is to look at the export push side of what we are trying to do. So the EDB is there and they're doing a very good job, but they're very underfunded in what they can. Um, and they rely really on uh, sitting in Colombo and uh, trying to find market information about distant markets. And that's really not good enough. We, we have to really uh, link up uh, the presence that we have. We have 60 officers abroad through our foreign missions and we have to have a much more joined up approach to export marketing of Sri Lanka. That's the first thing we have to do. That is what we produce. The second thing we have to do uh, is to look at those possible industries which could add a billion or maybe $2 billion worth of exports and deal with all the supply constraints they face. And those may be things like gems and jewelry. They may be the agricultural exports. Uh, they may indeed be uh, some other smaller things that we may produce. Um, and I think we really have to be ruthless in uh, getting rid of the constraints, be the red tape, be the credit things. That's the second thing we need to do. The third thing we need to try to do um, is to bring in foreign investment, uh, but in a much more uh, open manner than we have done. We, we like to regulate, um, and I think we have been over-regulatory, uh, and that could help us in the big industries for which we have no capacity uh, to be able to take off in the exports. And then there's the whole import regime. Th th thank you very much. Thank you, Ganesh. Uh, well, I just have two points. I think Ganesh has covered all the, all the important points. Just two points, if I may add to supplement what he said. Um, one is if you look at a country as large as China or a country as small as uh, Singapore, FDI has played a critical role in export transformation. So we need to find out why is it we have we are so we perform so poorly in terms of FDI, and if in there are so many surveys where investors have been uh, uh, asked the question, what are the critical things that determine their um, decisions regarding location of investment? Tax concession don't come very high up on the agenda. It's macro stability, political stability. There are a number of other things. We focus entirely on tax concessions. I'm not saying they're, not, they're useless, but they're not the really important things. We have to get our macro right. We have to have political stability. We have to have a, a open, friendly attitude towards foreign investment. Uh, all those other things need, and, and also the, the business and the doing business environment. We can't be you know, 100 on the doing business index. I know there are issues about the doing business index now, but anyway, that's a useful tool. We, are, we have to improve on that. So we have to do all those things, then we'll get FDI. I should also say, um, in my earlier answer, when I was saying that we have a big external financing gap, there's a real problem in the next 12 months because the non-finance, non-debt creating inflows will take time. You know, export growth, uh, sale of assets, um, investment into port city, that's not gonna happen in the next 12 months. It's that immediate crunch that I was talking about. Anyway, to go back, sorry, I'm going all over the place. To go to exports, one is to create the right environment for FDI to come in. The other thing is, um, you know, we are consistently, uh, consistently making our exporters run 110 meters in a 100 meter race by having an overvalued exchange rate. We, we basically subsidize foreign producers uh, at the expense of our exporters and our import competing industries. So we need to have a competitive exchange rate and to have it stable, have a stable and competitive exchange rate, we have to fix the budget. That's where the problem comes from. Then the other point is protection. You know, in as you know, uh, today 
exports are all about, you know, you are an expert on this, global production networks. We have excluded ourselves by having all this protection. You need, in, in the modern uh, uh, production networks, you have to have the, the line or the line differentiating exports and imports gets blurred. You have to be able to bring in import something as which is part of the production chain, do your little bit and send it out. Now, if you put a tariff in the middle of that, you become uncompetitive, which is what we have done, which is why we have not been able to penetrate global supply chains. So exchange rate, um, protection, not excluding us from uh, global supply chains and a competitive ex uh, and, and a, uh, environment that is conducive for FDI. Those are the things we need to do. Thank you, uh, thank you, Indrajit. And Nihal, uh, do you find any uh, thing to add in this situation? And there's also a question about, because of the lack of fiscal space and what are the options that Sri Lanka has? And one of the options is, to my understanding, improve the fiscal space and both the revenue side and expenditure side. And But other than that, Nihal, do you have anything to add? I would uh, just say that in relation to uh, bringing uh, foreign investment in, I think uh, one of the things but that, but I have come across is that our really poor ranking in the enforcing of contracts in, in Sri Lanka. It is almost impossible to get a, get a commercial contract properly enforced. By properly enforced, I mean in a in a speedy manner. I mean, it, by the time it gets enforced, it is of no use to anybody. So that is, I think, something that we need to give special attention to. It is not because that our laws are not sufficient. I think we have quite quite a good set of laws, but the administration of uh, those laws is leaves much to be desired. So I would think uh, that is something that we can uh, do not without without too much of difficulty. Actually streamline the whole system of how administer, uh, laws are administered through the court system here. The, the, so that is something I think which will give a lot of comfort to foreign investors or for that matter for, to, to local investors and will promote investment. So I would, uh, fiscal space, I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I'm not the best person to talk about that. We all know what needs to be done. But how to do it, I think, has been the challenge, I guess, for, for, for the, the political will to do it has been the challenge. Yeah. Thank you, Nihal. And there's also a question that was uh, about the IMF conditionalities. Actually, uh, I want to say that uh, it is not the case that IMF is uh, staring out there, waiting for us to come uh, to them and then expecting to lay down all these conditions to make our lives miserable. And it's a negotiating uh, platform, as you have rightly mentioned in the question also. But I must also say that uh, Professor Pemachandra Tukorl from Australian National University, he's, uh, he's, uh, he has done a paper, already draft is finished. And the IMF history of Sri Lanka and indicating all these 16 times that Sri Lanka has resorted to IMF, uh, IMF assistance. And starting from actually the Trotsky's finance minister, uh, Dr. N.M. Pereira, and he has acknowledged and he's, he has also gone to the IMF to receive financial assistance in the early 70s. So uh, together with that, he has also compiled all these 16 times uh, working with the IMF. So he, as he mentioned a couple of days ago, he has not found any fault with going to IMF. In fact, the fault is on our side. So uh, uh, before I wind up the question, well, there are many questions, over 30, 33 questions to my understanding right now, but uh, given the time constraints, it's not possible, but I should also uh, go to Dilini. Uh, Dilini, are you there? Yes, your mic has to be unmuted and you got a couple of questions, right? Take about two minutes. Sure. So I think there are a couple of questions, uh, both related to gender. And the first one is really why ECEC now during the pandemic and uh, the, the uh, ECEC is not suggested during the pandemic. Uh, this would be as part of a post-pandemic recovery uh, focusing on freeing up 
female labor to participate in post-pandemic recovery. Uh, the second question um, is about, is there political space for this type of fiscal stimulus? And I'm going to answer that question in a couple of ways. Uh, one is to interpret it as meaning, uh, do we have uh, the fiscal space? And I think I'm going to refer to what uh, Dr. Kumaraswamy talked about earlier. Uh, you know, depending on which route we go, where we would get our funding from, um, and if we were to, in order to uh, fund fiscal spending, if we had to then cut back on, on either other kinds of uh, fiscal spending, or if we had to raise revenues through taxation, do we have the political space for that? I think you know that that is a big question. But on the other hand, uh, it's also a question of what type of austerity we want to go through. So uh, I want to actually, uh, you know, there was a recent forum where somebody said we could either grow ourselves out of the debt uh, situation or we could starve ourselves out of the debt situation. I think perhaps they said we would rather grow ourselves than starve ourselves. And I think that is the point that we are making, that a lot of people uh, agree needs to be made. That there is, in a sense, we don't have an option but to grow. Uh, and so if we are thinking of, we obviously need fiscal stimulus in addition to FDI uh, and trade. Uh, and so I, I would think that there is space for that. Um, do we have political space for spending on uh, on uh, sort of gender sensitive uh, expenditure? I think I think if the case is made clearly as to why we need female labor force participation to uh, increase, and that in a sense female labor force participation is the space that we have if you are thinking about domestic labor. Uh, then I think there is political space for spending that is gender sensitive. Thank but you. You have more? Right, okay, thank you, Dil. Uh, there are uh, many questions in the chat box and directed also to uh, all the panelists individually, but I think uh, given the time constraints, uh, we have to close it right now. And before we close, and I would like to invite uh, uh, my co-chair, Indrajit, to take a couple of minutes to give the concluding remarks. Thank you, Professor. Let me, um, I just want to make three, four points. Um, one is, I think one of the key lessons from um, the whole experience um, we've had in terms of economic management uh, coming out of the pandemic is the importance of having buffers in our economy. You know, I don't know of any other country in the region that has imposed import controls and capital controls. And our fiscal stimulus was by some ways the smallest uh, in the region, the 0.8. Even countries who have a far lower per capita income than us have been able to do more. That is because we had no buffers. We had no fiscal space and our external reserves were not sufficient. So. The lesson is, and this is a lesson that the East and Southeast Asians learned after the East Asian crisis, that you must have buffers in your economy. They built up external reserves as insurance. They create, they had fiscal space um, to, to intervene uh, when necessary. So over, this is, can't be done over, over, overnight, but I think this is a lesson. We can't live on the edge because the world is becoming more uncertain. You could have climate shocks, the geopolitical tensions may create price movements in the world economy, which hit us uh, by way of an exogenous shock. There are so many things that can go on. So we have to build buffers. And, and the biggest constraint uh, as far as building buffers is the government's fiscal operations. So that, uh, uh, that throughout, that has been the problem. It's the main source of instability, whichever government, whichever government is in power. Now, if you look at, I'm just picking the last uh, two cycles, it, but you can 
Look at any cycle and the same happens. In 2015, the government that came in had a utterly unsustainable budget in February, I think, of 2015, an interim budget, which gave away a lot of stuff on the expenditure side, which was unsustainable. Then this government came in and introduced utterly unsustainable revenue measures. The previous government wanted to win the general election and did those things. This government wanted a two-thirds majority and did these things. So we, we just cannot go on like this, you know, because we are on the edge. We have to break this cycle. Somehow we have to break this cycle. And that's why I say maybe we need to legislate and tie our hands. We need to look how we can tie our hands because we're not doing it well enough without it. Second point I want to make is Dilani uh, made these points very, very powerfully and Ganeshan also did. I think in the short run, we need to see how we can focus resources on putting people who have suffered most back on their feet. Uh, that is the people, the poor who have got further immiserated, people who have the half a million who seem to have been pushed into poverty, the women who've lost employment, the children whose education has been badly scarred. We need to re focus resources on that. Now, infrastructure is important. I know pri priority is being given uh, you know, to, to roads, to irrigation, to water supply, all very important. And all of them can have actually good growth and distributional impact. But in, in the immediate future, maybe we need to divert some resources and make sure that we look after the people who need support and then maybe phase out some of the capital expenditure. The third thing I'd like, the point I'd like to make on, on the external financing, I have spoken at some length. The only two points I want to make to re-emphasize again, the way out of the problem is non-debt creating financing, not non creating flows. That is exports, FDI, remittances, et cetera. But that's going to take time. How do we fill the gap in the short run, in the next 12, 18 months? Or where are we going to get the money? And what is the best way of doing it? What is the, there is no painless way. We must be very clear about that. There is absolutely no painless way of doing it. You go to an IMF, you have some pain. If you don't go to the IMF, in my view, the pain will be more. So that is the call that our leaders have to make. Which way do they go? If they think that they have a solution without the IMF, which is less painful, of course, we should grab that. But for the moment, I'm not seeing it. But maybe in the roadmap that's coming up on the 1st of October, we will see a way of doing it, uh, uh, you know, which, which is re relatively less painful. Um, and on the, on the uh, one, one thing on the debt management I like to say is, the, there was a medium-term debt management strategy that was published in April 2019. I would encourage people who are interested in this whole debt area to look at that because it, it advocated a more gradualist process. Because if you suddenly stop borrowing, how do you, how do you, you know, service the debt? Because you create a big gap. Historically, we've raised about $2.5 billion dollars through international sovereign bond issuances. That has to be brought down, but that has to be brought down gradually when, with the government achieving primary surpluses in the budget and us increasing our non-debt creating flows. You attack it from both sides, in terms of the demand for financing and in terms of the supply of financing. But it takes time. If you suddenly stop, you have a shortage of dollars. So the two factors that have contributed to the shortage of dollars is the sudden stoppage of access to international capital markets. And to have access to international capital markets, we would have had to have had an IMF program and we would have had to perhaps had a different trajectory of policy. But in terms of uh, 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 how, you, how you navigate going forward, I think we need to learn those lessons because we are in a different paradigm where we are exposed to these capital markets and rating agencies in a way that and so we have to manage that. Final point on the budget. Uh, as I said, expenditure levels are reasonably, you know, the level is okay, improve the quality, but we have to find a way of increasing revenue, getting up closer to 15% over time. Uh, I think we can negotiate with the IMF. They won't want us to squeeze the economy during a pandemic. 
but we need to backload the fiscal adjustment as much as possible through negotiation, but we will have to do it because modern monetary theory, I personally don't think modern monetary theory works even in countries which have a reserve currency. But if you don't have a reserve currency, it simply does not work. But what we have had is not MMT. What we've had is very aggressive monetary policy, which was absolutely the right thing for the central bank to do when there was demand destruction and supply disruption due to the pandemic. The economy had contracted and the central bank had to support it. And there was space to do so without the economy overheating because the economy was well below capacity. As recovery takes place, the, the extent to which you can have expansionary accommodative monetary policy gets less and less. So as we go forward now and as recovery takes hold, if the central bank continues to do the extent of um, deficit financing it has done, that transmission through into inflation and balance of payment pressure, and through that, the currency will get greater and greater as, as the economy comes closer and closer to potential. So we have to find some other way of financing the budget. And for that, you have to increase revenue. We need to think of how to widen the base. We need to look at rates, tax rates. Do we need to tax things we have not taxed before? All these things should be on the table, but we need to get revenue over time up to about 15% of GDP. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Indrajit. And what he said actually is uh, looking at these two twin deficit, and one is the fiscal deficit, and one is the external deficit, and where we have to build our buffers, not the short-term buffers, but the long-term buffers. But in fact, at the beginning also in uh, introducing his uh, remarks, uh, uh, he also mentioned that uh, the lack of reforms uh, for a couple of decades in the past and even before the pandemic, and that's what I mentioned about pre-pandemic problems of the economy and uh, not everything is pandemic related. So that when we look at the pre-pandemic issues, uh, I think, uh, to my understanding, for about 25 years, we haven't heard of reforms in this country. We haven't heard of economic reforms. And we need to, this is, if it is a politically sensitive thing and if it is a difficult thing, uh, difficulties and crises are the good soil to initiate reforms, actually. All those things which are impossible or which are difficult, they have the they, they can be implemented, they can be adopted in the crisis situation because crisis permit for bitter uh, dosage to be taken. And in that sense, I think we can, we, we, we have the space to address fiscal problems. We have the space to address exports and FDI problems that the, the country is having for decades. And in fact, through that, we will not going back to recovery stage, but we will be going even beyond that. In fact, uh, to sustain our future, we need our economic future. We need to go beyond the recovery of the pandemic issue. So with that remark, I want to close this session right now. And I want to thank our, all the panelists and uh, including the, the main presenter, Dr. Ganesh and Victor Raja, and then the, the uh, two discussions, Dr. Dileni Gunavartana and Mr. Nihal Ponseka, and also my co-chair, Dr. Indrajit Kumar Asami, and behind the screen supporting us, Ms. Arusha Amira Arush. Amira Arush is from the Pathfinder, and with her staff, is supporting us and looking after all these organizational matters, coordinating matters and technical matters. And finally, all the distinguished, distinguished uh, guests and invitees and uh, in our audience and we really appreciate your presence even up to this point and I can see more than 130 uh, people are still there. Thank you so much and wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you for being a part of this. Just to take two minutes of your time on behalf of Pathfinder whilst thanking our panel. Uh, we would also like to take this opportunity to thank the participants for showing such great enthusiasm uh, by posting so many questions and being so interactive. 
um, we all, I would like to let you know that we hope to have two uh, webinars in the next couple of weeks that will broadly focus on um, the IMF and Sri Lanka's relationship with the fund. And in that, we, in this regard, we'll be having discussions with two very eminent persons. In fact, uh, immediately next Wednesday, that's within a week, next Wednesday, the 29th, uh, we will be in conversation with Dr. Nadimul Haq. Um, I don't think he needs to be introduced to anybody in this part of the world, and especially to Sri Lankans. He uh, worked in the IMF for over two decades, and I think it was during his tenure with the, with the fund that he was a part of the public sector reform in Sri Lanka. And once we've finished with Dr. Haq, we will also soon be having a discussion with Mr. Anup Singh who again uh, had a long and illustrious um, uh, career with the IMF. And very interestingly was the IMF uh, kind of representative, I think in Sri Lanka, when, Sri La when the country uh, uh, bega uh, began to liberalize in the late seventies. So I hope you will be engaged with Pathfinder. Um, all the relevant information will be on all our social media platforms. Um, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Thank you, panel, for an excellent job. Take care, everyone. Be safe.